Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gregory Nichols. I'm a subject matter expert with the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar where we will be discussing our findings from the state-of-the-art report we conducted this year on identifying chemical biological weapons use. So very briefly, the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC, is one of three Department of Defense Information Analysis Centers. We sit within the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, a report up through the Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC. We're responsible for acquiring, analyzing, and disseminating scientific and technical information across eight focus areas. In support of the U.S. Department of Defense and other government research and development activities. And as you can see, our mission is to be the go to RD, ST, and RDT and E leader within the Homeland Defense and Security communities. So, a little bit on the state of the art reports and why we do these. These are annual reports that we conduct on relevant scientific and technical topics that the Department of Defense. Um, is aligning towards and information that they are seeking to gather on very pertinent areas. Uh, for this particular report, we reached out to subject matter experts within our network, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the presentation if you're interested in becoming a SME with our center. We also drew on research that we conducted here with our experts um, at our basic center of operations. Our authors covered a, a broad range of uh, researchers from academia, national labs, and federal agencies, as well as support here from HDIAC. So why this topic, why now? Why chem bioweapons? Well, this really is a subject that got some uh, high attention going back to 2001, uh, following the series of letters containing anthrax that were sent out across the United States. This was a very complex investigation, and at the time, uh, the U.S. lacked standards in terms of bioforensics analysis and coordinating such a, a response to uh, an event like this. Um, so there was a lot of, of gaps and challenges that were identified during that investigation, and a lot of wheels were put into motion that ultimately led to a whole bunch of new standards and a lot of new techniques and research funding that was invested in um, making this type of investigation a little bit easier and better to conduct. So we've come a long way, but we still have some things that obviously we need to work on. And, you know, in the almost 20 years since the anthrax attacks, uh, we've, we've had some other new challenges, uh, specifically in the past year or so, um, that also made this a lot more relevant to talk about today and what are we doing in this space. So, for example, we've, we've had chemical weapons use in the Syrian civil war um, involving sarin, chlorine, and mustard. Uh, there's been some concern with fentanyl, fentanyl derivatives such as carfentanil being used as incapacitating agents. So how can we identify these potential exposures sooner? Uh, we've had in earlier this year in March, there was a nerve agent attack on a Russian spy um, in the United Kingdom. So that's obviously some cause for concern. And then last year in 2017 in Kuala Lumpur, we had the assassination of Kim Jong-nam. Uh, using VX and even possibly as a binary agent. So some new developments in this space, and we'll talk a little bit more about some other challenges, specifically when we get to um, bioweapons. But some very relevant information we want to talk about. What's new in the field? Where is it going? How can we identify and detect some of these things uh, before they become a problem? And afterwards, how can we do the forensic analysis to uh, identify the responsible parties? So very briefly, at a high-level view, just wanted to go over some themes that we saw in this report. So our experts found that a lot of these technologies um, kind of cluster together. So we see a lot of trending towards building smaller devices. A lot of this is driven by technology. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, on the next slide. But making smaller components, which makes smaller machines, and this makes it easier to bring things out into the field to the point of care. We also see a trend in making uh, diagnostic times and um, reducing the amount of time that it takes to, to run a sample and get a result. A lot of that is being driven by these smaller components. Universal detection is something that a lot of uh, researchers are trying to achieve. A lot of agencies are supporting research that would allow uh, one machine to either run multiple matrices and identify uh, agents across those different matrices or even identify multiple agents at the same time in one sample. 
And of course, the, the increased mobility, making things portable, a lot of that has to do with the smaller machines. And then something that's always been a challenge, especially when you try to make something smaller, uh, decreasing the cost, and not just in manufacturing, but also um, in running the machine. Sometimes tests can be expensive, laboratory tests can be expensive. So trying to make sure that we're not just making smaller machines that are affordable, but we can make um, it cheaper to actually run these things so they can be effective. So just briefly, these are going to be the areas that we'll cover throughout this webinar today. These align with the report itself. And so we had an introductory chapter and then the subsequent chapters um, align exactly with the bullet points that we have on the board. We're going to spend a little bit more time with detection for chemical biological agents because that's really the core focus of this report. And then we'll talk about some other areas that are related to uh, the technologies that we discuss um, in that topic. So first, let's begin with some kind of foundation and groundwork stuff here. So we're talking about um, the identification of detection technologies for ChemBio agents. And so a lot of the trends that we're seeing are really driving uh, this area of, of this whole topic. So we're seeing new advances in computational power, which is allowing uh, machines to run faster, to do more analyses in a shorter period of time. And we're seeing an improvement in communications capabilities and also Microfluidics is, is accelerating a lot of this development. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So these advances are really being driven by technology, uh, increasing computer processing power. So for example, um, as we add more chips, because chips are getting smaller, as you can see there, we're able to do a lot more things, which is making tests faster. Uh, we're also seeing improvement in the functionality of cell phones. It's amazing what you can do with an iPhone now or a Samsung device. Um, so there's a lot of um, opportunity where companies have actually made attachments that can be put onto these devices and turn a cell phone into a detector. So we're seeing a lot of trends in that way as well. And finally, the microfluidics is becoming um, an emerging area that's really allowing a lot of these things to develop even faster. So for example, new techniques in soft lithography, laser cutting, 3D printing are allowing uh, devices to um, be made a lot faster and cheaper, and in some cases, especially with 3D printing, possibly even printed um, on site and made on an as-needed basis. So this part is gonna be divided to uh, two different sections here. We have um, kind of the chemical detection side, and we're gonna talk about some of the equipment and the methods for that, and then we'll talk more about the biological detection here in a few minutes. So we, we start off with the basics, and this is um, pretty common to any kind of sample. You talk about the matrix that your uh, sample is coming from and the complexity of that, and then also how you prepare that. So these are some challenges that we still find. So obviously environmental contamination is a challenge, um, and you also need to, to be concerned with um, how the sample can reduce in size over time as you do multiple iterations of testing. You can lose lose sample size. And also the chemical could be altered um, if you don't have the right protections or if you're not putting it in the right um, conditions. So for example, uh, temperature, you know, especially heat could affect the sample, uh, exposure to sunlight, things like that. So when we look at chemical detection, kind of the foundational um, technology for this is mass spectrometry. This has been around for a long time and there's a lot of different types of equipment that are used for this. Um, when we talk about things that are fieldable and portable, we have basically a core of, of these three technologies, these three machines that we have up on the screen here. So I just want to briefly touch on these. So one of the earliest portable uh, mass spec um, pieces of equipment is the Inficon Hapsite. This is still very popular and used quite often. Uh, another one is the Swiss Detection Guardian platform, which is very common in military use. And then we also have another feudable device uh, developed by FLIR, the FLIR G510. One of the things that makes mass spec work is ionization. And so let's talk a little bit about what we see in terms of training analyses for ionization techniques. So one of the more common ones is direct analysis of real time or DART. Uh, this is a really good uh, technique because it works across all solids, liquids, and gases. And there's been some developments in this. There's a joint effort between a company called Ion Sense and Waters, which has developed a new uh, DART system based off of a QDA platform, it uses a quadrupole mass analyzer, and it's actually capable of ambient ionization. So that could really change the game in terms of accessibility. 
And I want to briefly mention a couple others here. So electrospay ionization is uh, most commonly found in lab-based equipment and not really in any portable platforms, but that could be something um, if we understand how to unlock the technology, it could be used to bring a lot more sophisticated equipment out to the field. And then a new development that our SMEs identified was um, the continuity platform for base spec. Again, another advanced ionization technique that um, is currently under development and could eventually become fieldable. So just a little bit more in chemical detection. Um, wanted to touch briefly on the optical spectroscopy part, especially because Raman and IR based techniques, infrared, these are commonly used, but these are very important because this allows us to do chemical fingerprinting. So we can analyze a sample and we can identify little nuances in each sample. And that helps us track these back towards a manufacturer, or even to identify a specific party that may have used these. So these techniques are very important in the forensics analysis and the forensics aspect of detection. And then probably one of the more important things um, that many of you are interested in, and of course, Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security would be interested in is field ability, right? So how do we actually take these uh, technologies, this equipment, and get it out into the field where people can use it right at the site where they need to use it? So in general, when we talk about field ability, uh, the warfighter should actually be capable of molecular and, and organic analysis, so trying to make instruments that can at least do those things. And I want to focus on the, the second bullet point there, the size, weight, and power, or SWAP. Uh, these are a set of characteristics uh, of governance which actually determine the feasibility of the deployment. So it's very important to understand how you can address these three things because that's good, that will determine what's actually going to be um, something achievable to bring out into the field. So we'll switch gears for a little bit um, and talk about biological detection. There is a lot more available, I think, in terms of uh, biological detection, the chemical detection. Um, and it's, it's mainly because the, the biology is a lot more complicated than the chemistry sometimes. And so there are these multiple assays that have been developed, which allow different levels of analyses and different sets of sophistication. So very briefly, we wanted to just talk about some of the foundation like we did for the chemical detection. Obviously, you've got the matrices that you're pulling these um, biological samples from, and sometimes these can be very complicated. And wanted to talk about one of the most complex, which is soil. Uh, this has been a challenge, and we talk about contamination for chemical agent. This is a real challenge for contamination with biological agents, uh, specifically humic acid, which is produced from the breakdown of organic uh, molecules. But humic acid is a no DNA amplification inhibitor, and so this obviously can be a challenge when you're looking at tests that rely on nucleic acids. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of these common classes, if you will, of tests that we see with biological agent detection. And I won't cover all of these. All of these, I just wanted to hit the high points here. So definitely want to talk about the first one: the lateral flow amino assays or assays or LFIs or LFAs. So these are very common tests that have been around for a long time. They have a lot of utility. Um, they're pretty cheap, they're pretty easy to use, very limited sample preparation. There are some disadvantages though, and one of those is that they often have very low sensitivity. Um, so if you need something that has a really high chance of being correct and giving you a positive value, this may not be exactly the test that you need, but it's a very good first cut to let you know if an agent is present or not. And so that brings us to the, the second disadvantage. It is a qualitative test. It can tell you yes or no that something is there, but it can't give you an amount or a concentration. But they do definitely have their utilities. Um, and so let's talk a lot about where these tests are going, because I think this is one of the areas that we identified in this report as um, really growing and seeing a lot of the emerging technology. So in terms of the LFIs or LFAs, um, one of the things is looking at ways where we can um, analyze multiple analytes or agents at the same time. And so these tests used to use, um, you know, paper backed um, sample areas. And now there's a lot of technology that's moving toward natural cellulose paper or natural cellulose paper backing or even other types of labeling detection. And so specifically, we've seen an introduction of quantum dots. Um, to replace some of the other antibodies uh, or some of the other labeling agents that have been used. And this is increasing 
the sensitivity of these tests. We've also seen um, some research that is using upconverting phosphors instead of the traditional colloidal gold particles that have been used for labeling. And so um, there have been reports that this can increase the sensitivity by 100 to 1,000 times. So quite a huge advantage in terms of being able to identify an agent that could be present. So let's skip down to the molecular detection and talk about these, these kinds of tests for a little bit. So there's basically two different types. Those are based on DNA and those are based on RNA, right? So anything that has one of these two um, genetic-based molecules um, can be detected with one of these tests. And one of the most common and one I want to spend a little bit of time on is polymerase chain reaction or PCR. Uh, we have two different types here. We've got a real time and an endpoint. The endpoint PCR is, is relatively easy to understand. So you run these different iterations of the test, and then at the end of the test, when you've amplified the DNA, you get one final reading, right? So you get one single output. The real time um, is a little bit different, a little bit more in depth. It can give you the changes um, in the DNA um, or the RNA, but give you the changes in the amplification at each stage. And so you can see how things are changing across a certain amount of time. Um, so, there's some other techniques that have, have been developed in this area, um, and one I think that's important to, to just briefly mention is the genome sequencing. We'll talk a lot more about that when we get to some of the other sections and, and where we kind of see the technology setting in the future, but this is becoming an important area. <clears throat> Obviously, the technology has been developing over a number of years. But now we're at the point where it's relatively easy and cheap to sequence genomes. And so two different types of classes here we're seeing, the Illumina sequencing and the nanopore sequencing. And we'll continue to monitor for developments in these areas. So very briefly, just wanted to talk about some alternative technologies to these. And then we'll uh, mention diagnostics and we'll, cut, we'll head off. But basically, um, in alternative technologies, I think some of the more interesting ones that we've seen developed uh, would be the pads, the paper-based analytical devices. And these come with two different types. Um, this is another technology that was once based on paper, and now we're seeing a shift to nitrocellulose. And so we have the micropads, um, and these are the paper-based assays or nitrocellulose-based assays, um, where microfluidic channels are actually carved into um, the substrate. There's a test like this that has been available for cystic fibrosis, uh, this technology is not currently available for warfighters, but there's some possibility that it could be integrated into a wearable device, such as a watch or something like that, a smartwatch, um, that would allow for, for real-time detection. So this is something to keep an eye on. Um, another type of patch technology is ePads, uh, and this is based off of the ability to actually screen print electrodes onto the paper and nitrocellulose backing. And so the E stands for electrochemical, so we're talking more about picking up signals um, from the analytes, and there have been tests like this already developed for glucose monitoring, and so we can look at other types of, of agents in the future um, and possibly be able to identify these in real time. Um, just briefly wanted to touch on the diagnostics side of this. So a lot of these tests um, are also used in the clinical space. Um, there are some differences here. Um, and, you know, mainly these tests that they're going to be used for diagnostics have to be FDA approved or FDA cleared. Um, and so that could take a lot of time. But by the time you get to that point, these tests are fairly well developed and pretty sensitive um, to the assay or to the agent that they're trying to identify. Uh, the World Health Organization has some criteria on what diagnostic tests should, should look like. A lot of it really comes down to affordability and practicality, right? So making sure that if we're going to take something and put it into a point of care environment, that it's actually something that's going to be very relevant and not unwieldy. So we're gonna wrap up this section here and, and start to shift our focus um, to a little bit more of the report, but just wanted to briefly give you an overview of where we see these technologies going in terms of detection where our SMEs kind of forecast things heading. Um, I think we're still looking at a lot of ways where we can have sampling techniques that don't require a lot of preparation. Um, so that's going to make it a lot easier to feel these things. Um, as I mentioned, the genomic sequencing, the genome type tests are becoming very important and popular. 
And then, of course, anything that you can do to reduce the cost and improve the sustainability, right, of a piece of equipment is going to make it more um, desirable to bring out into the field. So we're going to shift gears here and we're going to talk about a, a more specific type of technology and development. And this one is based off of some experts that we have from USAMRID and um, the Army um, CEHR. We're going to talk about um, a project they've been working on, which is biology-based sensors for detecting chemicals in drinking water. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this because uh, you would really be better served reading the reports and, and really diving into this chapter because it's very complex and it's very, very good. But I just will do it justice here in the short amount of time that we have. But I wanted to hit the highlights. And so this was developed to address a gap that um, DoD has in a rapid detection of um, identifying toxic chemicals in drinking water. And so they developed this device called the Environmental Sentinel Biomonitor System, or the ESB. And if you look to the right in that figure, you'll see um, the ESB apparatus here. Um, it comes in a really nice case, and it's got two different pieces and two components. It has an electric cell substrate impedance sensing device, and it also has a pesticide sensor. So those two systems work together to create this whole platform. Um, this was designed in mind to complement Army field and chemical detectors such as the WQAS PM. Um, the idea is that it could provide a rapid detection, something in less than one hour. And it, it has some limitations. It is qualitative, not quantitative, but at least it could tell you if something were present or not. So again, I would encourage you to go and read our report, take a look at this chapter, really dive in. If you have any questions, um, my contact information will be available. We can also put you in contact with the authors of this section. We can talk more about the research. But these are some of the challenges they identified and where they want to go in terms of future directions. So, so this is a biologically based product. It, you know, it's been a challenge finding the right types of cells and cell lines. So this is something that they'll continue to look at moving forward. Another limitation, which I think is interesting, there's some limitations in detecting acetylcholine esterase inhibiting insecticides, so the organophosphates. Um, this is something I think will be important as these types of agents could also be used as chemical warfare agents and capacitating agents. So it'll be interesting to see where they go moving forward. And then, of course, you know, kind of a theme, we talked about genomics being important. Here they've listed all types of omics analysis, so we get into proteomics and metabolomics and things like that. But that's another thing looking forward that they would like to add onto this platform and develop that better. So we kind of spent the first couple sections getting a little bit more down into the weeds, into the detail, talking about specific identification and detection technologies and then a very specific uh, project. So we're going to kind of back up a little bit and and look at a more high level view in terms of chemical and biological detection. And this is really more about situational awareness, right? Understanding what, what happens before and after an event. And so as you can see, the definition of situational awareness is up there, but these are the perception of the elements in the environment within a volume of time and space, the comprehension of their meaning, and the projection of their status in the near future, right? So really trying to understand how all these things come together, create an event, and then how we can warn people, identify things, and track down responsible parties. So we talk about situation awareness before an event. We're looking at technologies that we could develop that would be able to help us collect data about what potential assets could be used, how we could integrate that, that data into a bigger picture and understanding activities, then identifying anything that looks abnormal that we may need to investigate. So that happens before an event, or as we say, to the left of the boom. And then after an incident, or to the right of the boom, right? We want to take all of that data, all of those things, the technology we use to gather stuff before the event, and then we want to use that and see how that could play a key role in investigating the attack and even tracing the material back to the responsible party. So we talked a little bit about forensics and some fingerprinting technologies. So that's when that stuff is becoming very relevant. We're going to talk in the next section about bioforensics. Um, so very similar, just looking at the biological side of this. but. Um, how do we take the information that we have before an event and use that to either mitigate the risk or identify the responsible parties? 
So our authors, I think, did a very good job of distilling this information down into a very easy to understand type of way. And one of the ways that they did that was they kind of made these really nice classifications and created a very simple two by two table. And this explains this framework very well, the situational awareness and the supply chain management where we get into chemical and biological agents. And so just kind of briefly, you can see that we've got the two different classes here on the left. We've got the location tracking. We're looking at supply chains in terms of a system level, and then also laboratories and facilities, which um, they refer to as a node. When you look at the asset types on the, the top there, we have two different types, right? We've got agents, which could be the chemical biological agents or any kind of precursor. And then we also have the equipment, right? How would you actually uh, create these things, uh, have delivery devices, examples, so things like that. Um, one of the ways that we can track a lot of these things is through inventory, right? And so inventory management is something that's been around for a long time. Um, kind of the original technology, I guess, that we use to track things would be barcodes, right? That's a really good example. Now, barcodes are limited, but they're still effective. Um, you can track things when they show up at a destination, but you can't necessarily always track them in real time. And so that's led to the incorporation of other types of technologies that could do that. So we're also seeing a lot of transition to the Internet of Things and cloud-based tracking systems, right? And so the IoT allows sensors to be put on different things, um, and you can watch the shipment going as long as you have a Wi-Fi environment. And you can see where all these things are, are um, moving to and ending up at. Um, so this could be really interesting to see in the future how um, these technologies for tracking involve and how the chemical biological detection side is going to infuse more with the supply chain management side. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention before we move on um, kind of looking at the bigger picture, right? So when we look at the systems level stuff with tracking, uh, we talk more about organizations and the technologies that they have. And a lot of these come out of, um, they could come out of statutes, they could come out of treaties, um, et cetera. So um, a couple organizations that help track these things, and we use that information um, to, you know, protect people and try to reduce um, the various events, but one is the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, or OPCW. Another is the statute, the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards, or CFATS. Um, this is what DHS uses to identify um, facilities in the United States that produce legitimate materials, industrial materials such as ammonia, that in certain quantities could be dangerous if they got into the wrong hands, right? So that's a way that we can look at the supply chain aspect and even the node identifying where these specific facilities are. A couple other things just to mention, ammonium nitrate security program, again, uh, another important thing. And then export controls are typically um, at a very high states or international or even, you know, um, national level. But we've got a group called the Australia Group, which looks at export control standards across a variety of different countries. And then here in the United States, uh, Department of Commerce and Department of State are responsible for monitoring and setting export controls for certain things, such as materials that could be used in the development of nuclear weapons and production facilities for chemical agents and things like that. So we've got the two different aspects of looking specifically at tracking individual things and then monitoring the system level at large. And so moving you know, out of this section and just kind of reflecting on on where we've been and what we talked about with situational awareness, I think our, our SMEs did a really good job of identifying some areas where there are some gaps. And I think these gaps could set up um, opportunities for research and development, and technology development in the future. So just briefly, you can see the bullets here, but, you know, we broke this out into some really nice questions. So clarifying who owns the system level view, we talked about uh, some of the standards like CFATs and export control. So, um, kind of looking at that and who would be responsible for developing technology that's going to improve uh, things at that level. Um, identifying what assets are highest risk and therefore high priority. So is it chlorine, is it ammonia, is it something else, for example. Um, and then advancing how data is gathered, integrated, and analyzed. And this is a lot where technology can come into um, developing these things and making this a lot easier, especially when you see sensors um, infused with the IoT uh, cloud-based things, uh, that computing power that we talked about earlier. So 
this is going to make things a lot easier to um, kind of put together and analyze. All right, so we're moving towards the end here, but I think we've got one of the most important chapters um, to discuss. And this kind of ties everything back to the beginning where I talked about the anthrax attacks in 2001. So this section was all about bioforensics. And so you can see bioforensics is a study of biological organisms and processes with the investigatory approach of establishing incident related facts. So once an event happens, we go in, do we have the right tools, technologies, methods to identify the agents that are used, that are present, um, and who manufactured them, who put them there, et cetera. Um, so I won't go over all of this, but I do want to mention something that I think is really interesting. So, you know, a lot of times we think that an event is intentional, but as we see, especially on the biological side, a lot of infusion of new technologies such as synthetic biology and gene editing, um, there is also becoming the possibility that we could have an accidental release, and that would also warrant an investigation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. So traditionally, bioforensics is focused on naturally occurring pathogens, bacteria, viruses, and toxins, things that haven't been altered that just exist, exist normally. Um, however, technology is really pushing not just the limits of um, what we can do in terms of scientific, but also the limits in terms of the technologies we have available to identify some of these new types of organisms. Um, so if you look on the left there, I've got some bullets to kind of uh, just show you some of these technologies that, that we've discussed in the report and some things that many of you are probably familiar with, but gene editing or genetic engineering, you know, this is one where we can um, take certain genes out, put certain genes in. We can do this with relatively simple organisms such as bacteria, uh, but there's some new technologies that have been developed that are making the gene editing a lot easier um, than it used to be. And so one of those technologies is CRISPR which many of you are probably familiar with, but clustered, regular, interspaced, short palindromic repeats. Uh, this is a technology that's been in the news recently. We had some reports um, that a Chinese scientist recently used CRISPR to edit some human embryos. So this is something that is kind of rising to the top of the news cycle, something that we really need to uh, pay attention to. But this is also um, going to be a challenge in terms of bioforensics, because once you alter an organism, it's not going to be as easy to identify certain bacteria because the genetic footprint is now being changed. A couple of other things I'll just briefly touch on. Synthetic biology, where we're using engineering principles um, to basically make new types of biological systems. And then another trend, the do-it-yourself biologists or garage scientists, uh, people can actually buy sophisticated kits now and, and do a lot of this biotechnology work um, at, at a small lab. Um, that's maybe off the radar. So obviously that has some implications in terms of terrorist activities or nefarious use. Um, a couple of things that the FBI is doing to mitigate this risk, and this is kind of going back to the supply chain management that we talked about, but identifying these agents and these nodes um, you know, at the source. So there's the bioterrorism prevention team, which deals a lot with these types of new technologies. Then the FBI also has a tripwire initiative where manufacturers, distributors of materials that would be used in biological manufacturing and processing can call the FBI and let them know if they receive a request for kind of something unusual, maybe a really high quantity, maybe a combination of things that would lead them to believe uh, the purchase could be suspect. So some ways that the FBI is getting involved to try to mitigate the uses of some of these new biological technologies. And so I think this slide really sums up um, the biological forensics, the bioforensics really well. These are the classes of techniques that are often used to identify what agents may be present. Um, we talked earlier in the biological detection about um, PCR. And so real-time PCR applications are being used in a lot of these, especially with the bacteriology and the virology. Um, the genomics is another important aspect we've, we've been discussing throughout, throughout this webinar. Uh, it's going to become more important. In fact, uh, we've had some SMEs here at HDIAC um, from DITRA present on some of their research in that. And they work with LANO. They actually developed a platform called Edge Bioinformatics. And so that's a way 
to look at rapid genomic detection. And so it was developed by Los Alamos National Lab, and Vitra now manages that project. There's also ways that we can look at other types of um, materials, if you will, or um, mo molecules. And so I mentioned proteomics earlier. That's another one that's being used in bioforensics. Um, and so there's been a lot of interest in DUD to develop investigatory techniques. So DITRA is doing a lot, DARPA is doing a lot, and we've seen a lot of interest in funding in this area. So looking forward, um, you know, I think our report gave us a really good idea of where things currently are. And in each chapter, if you get a chance to read it, you'll see there's been kind of a little bit of a forecasting of where things may be heading. And overall, I just kind of pulled out some trends that I thought were worth mentioning um, where the field as a whole is, is moving. And so the first area is that we're seeing a trend towards identifying cellular mechanisms of interaction in individuals. So if somebody is exposed to a chemical or biological agent, how do their cells, how do the processes actually respond? So both of these programs I have here are from DARPA. Uh, first is Prometheus. This is a program that's actually trying to determine if a person may be contagious before they're actually symptomatic, right? So this is a very important challenge. Um, people can be carriers and spread disease even if they don't show signs of having that disease. So if we can identify this sooner, we can treat them, we can get them isolated so that they don't spread anything. Another uh, program is the Rapid Threat Assessment. This is a program designed at understanding the cellular level of interaction following a chemical biological exposure. This obviously has some implications in identifying um, agents because you can look at the process that's been initiated in the backtrack and identify the agent that caused it. But it's also very important in, a, in developing um, treatment regimes, right? So it's always exposed. This is what they are going to be used for. A couple other areas I want to talk about. Population level monitoring. We have seen this a lot of big interest since uh, 2001 following uh, the 9-11 attacks. We had the BioWatch program uh, monitored by DHS. Many of us know that that program uh, didn't quite give us the results that we were hoping for, and so looking at a suitable replacement for that. There's also been uh, research funded by DARPA uh, called Sigma, and Sigma initially started with placing radiation monitors throughout a city, monitoring levels in real time as something first responders could use. Um, but now there's kind of a next iteration of this, Sigma Plus, which looks at integrating uh, the chemical and biological sensors into the radiation detector. So really creating this very robust picture. Um, and then we we talked about genomics a lot, but I think it's still really important. This is an area that will continue to grow. We're seeing a lot of investments in this. We're seeing a lot of technology development. I mentioned edge bioinformatics earlier. Uh, this is a, an area, this is a specific platform that I think is gaining a lot of traction. And so finally, um, another thing that we've seen in this report and some other other research activities and publications that we've done in the center here, uh, we've seen an increase in the interest and in the development of remote and non-invasive techniques. So I kind of put those in, in two different areas. We've got the technologies that could be used to identify exposure in a person, an individual. So remotely monitoring heart rate, heart rate variability, breath condensates, pupil dilation, body temperature, all things that could be signs of somebody um, infected with a biological agent or exposed to a chemical agent. The other aspect of that is looking at the agent itself, right? So standoff detection. Can we identify uh, a chemical from a distant? Um, and that way we, we keep people out of harm's way, um, but maybe it's something that we can still do rapidly enough to get the right information to the right person so that we can mitigate risk. So that concludes the discussion on the report. I do encourage you to uh, go out and read it. Uh, we'll have it available for download. Um, at the end of the presentation, we'll have the slides as well. We've got some other information about HDI posted. Uh, this webinar will be available on our website and social media channels. Uh, so I encourage you to go. And if you want to listen to this again, read the report, um, I think it would get a much bigger picture of, of everything that we discussed today. So before we conclude, just wanted to mention a few things about HDI and some of the services that we offer. Uh, first, we have a technical inquiry service. This is um, four free hours of 
analyses and information that we provide. We can conduct literature searches, document requests, any sort of analysis. And this applies to the eight areas that we cover. And you can see what those are up on, on the screen. Um, so if you have a question, um, and this is open to academia, industry, and government. Um, if you have a question in one of these areas, feel free to reach out to us. We will uh, con consult our subject matter experts. We will look at our documents and the repositories that we have, and we will provide uh, a very nice report for you. If we are unable to answer your question um, within those four hours, or if you desire a little bit more detailed information, uh, then we have another option called the core analysis task. Um, this is a this is pre-competed and pre-awarded, and this is a way where we can actually help you with a project and something that's a little bit more involved in the technical inquiry. Uh, there are a couple caveats to this. Currently, there's a cap of $500,000 on these projects, and they must comp be completed within 12 months. But uh, we will work with you. We will develop a uh, statement of work based off of your needs, and then we will walk you through this process and provide a much deeper level of analysis for you. So I mentioned this at the beginning, but I want to touch on this again. Um, we rely a lot on subject matter experts. We have an extensive network, and we're always looking for uh, new people who want to join us and help us. Um, we have a dedicated staff here that works in the center, um, but obviously covering eight areas that are very separate can be a challenge, so we rely a lot on the expertise of our experts in academia, industry, and government. If you're interested, um, you can reach out to me directly or you can go to our website and you can look up more about um, what SMEs do, how you can join, uh, some of the things that you may be engaged in. And so I encourage you to do that. This report was written by SMEs and we couldn't do the majority of the work that we do without your support. So finally, I wanted to thank everybody who made this report a reality. I want to thank all the HDI staff, our authors, our publications team. They pull all this together and make this uh, not just the report, but the webinar happened. So uh, thank you to all the work that they do. And also the authors that we have from all of these different agencies. We have a lot of government agencies and academia involved, and we just want to thank them for their work in making this a successful report. And so with that, I want to thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions about the webinar, feel free to contact me directly. Uh, Joel Hewitt is a colleague of mine, a fellow SME here in the center. He was an author on this report. He is more than welcome to, to field any questions as well. If there's something that we can't answer, we will reach out to the authors of the report, um, and if it's appropriate, may even get you in contact with them directly. So thank you again. Uh, don't forget to check out our website, find out more information, and then continue to follow us on social media. So thank you, and have a wonderful afternoon.